Okay, we look forward to the uh, final lesson for today by Brother Tim Hayes. And uh, just to give him an introduction, once again, he is also no stranger to us. He has been here before in Singapore multiple times. Uh, his, he has a family. His, his wife's name is Flora. They've been married for over 40 years. And uh, they are blessed with a daughter, a son, and five grandchildren. He is also a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. And uh, since 2007, he has been preaching for the Logan Martin Church of Christ. He does, uh, other than his preaching work at, at the Logan Martin Church of Christ, he serves as one of the elders and also as an online instructor for Forces College. So as a graduate of Forces College myself, I have sat through some of his lessons as well, and I have learned so much from him also. So uh, we look forward to, to hearing from him speak on this important topic. So we have covered the fathers, we've covered the mothers, and now we're going to cover the children. So without further ado, Brother Hayes. It is indeed my blessing and honor to be a part of this study, a, a study that one does not have to look far or to think very deeply to understand the necessity and the need for this study. We deem it so necessary in the congregation where I serve as minister and one of the elders at least one of our Sundays normally the second Sunday of the month, I teach a lesson concerning the home because I know of the dire straits in which our homes are found in, in America and I dare say around the world. We want to begin with some basic teachings concerning the home. They have been discussed this morning, the home and the concept of dealing with the husband, the man. And, and never let it be misunderstood that husband is indeed to be a male, a man. The woman is defined and described as the wife, the mother, a lady, a woman, female. I know this because I can read God's word in Genesis chapter 4. God said, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and she Conceived what? By him. And she brought forth a son. And brethren and friends, we can debate and we can discuss around the world, but that's still God's law. That's his law of marriage. That's his law of conception. That's his law of one being conceived and one being born. It takes a male and it takes a female. Never by the union of two men or never by the union of two women will they conceive. It was not so from the beginning and it will never be so. Our governments may deem it necessary and our governments may deem it so, but God's law still teaches the same truth. This morning we're going to realize and, and study God's word concerning these things. And I wanted to begin with this concept. Normally and often we describe and we define and we quote scriptures to our children. And as I think Brother Burroughs pointed out, then that's just the fact of it. Well, they, and it should be because it's God's law. But then it helps for me to understand why. Why I should do this? Brother V.P. Black, an older preacher in the brotherhood many years ago, preached many lessons and taught many seminars on stewardship. And he said he realized later in life when he first began to preach, he would teach just give. Give. Why? Because God said, brother, that ought to be enough. But it does help us, and God teaches us why. Brother Black said then he realized if he would tell the brethren why they should give, then they would give. Maybe that's the approach we need to understand in other teachings as well. We, we quote Paul in saying, children, obey your parents. And brethren, that, that verse is still in the Bible. It's still there. And it still means exactly what it did the day Paul wrote those and penned those words as inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Paul not only tells us the what, he tells us the why. And we want to spend some of our time and much of our time today in looking at the why. Not just that our children are to obey, but to help them understand why 
in how this is possible. I want to approach it like this. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus Christ tells of the one who was going astray or, or going away, and he was going to leave these talents, these opportunities with his servants. In Matthew 25, the Bible says in there in verse 15, under one he gave what? Five talents to one, two, and to another one. To every one according to his what? Several ability. What he, the things that he was able to handle. The things of which he was able to give care. That's the way that he assigned these talents. I want you to kind of think on that as we look at the idea of children. They're understanding the things they do. What are we doing? Parents, mother and father, husband, wife, what are we doing with what God has given us? Young people, if you're a child of God, you're old enough. If you're old enough to obey God, to be his child, you're old enough to ask this question, what am I doing with what God has given me? And if you're not a child of God, one day we pray you will be, you need to ask the question, what am I doing with what God has given me? In the United States, we've just gone from spring to summer. And normally in our part of the world, and I can't remember, are you on school break now or on holiday? We, we are there, and normally at the end of the year, the spring of the year, that, that means a number of things. It, to me, it means the awakening of life from that which has been dormant, uh, where the temperatures turn cold, the, the plants go dormant, and then the, as the ground begins warm, temperature warms, they, they awaken. It's a beautiful time of the year. In, in, in which I really enjoy. We, we, think of, we think of normally of animals giving birth, especially in the springtime of the year, the wild animals. So to see that new life. For you young ladies, I would suggest maybe your hearts grow a little more tender in, in the spring of the year. Why? Because oftentimes those who are of that age are looking toward marriage and weddings. Young men, in the spring of the year, maybe I'll just put it like this, most of the time we just kind of lose our minds. The ladies are more concentrated on this. And, but also we think about the graduates. I love attending a graduation. Why? Because when we think about the graduates, their dreams are infinite. They, they, can, they, they see no boundaries. They see no end. They see, see no reason that they cannot overcome all that is set before them. When we think of God's word in light of these things, we're thinking of the young hearts of God. And, and as we think about the young hearts of God, we have to understand what, while you may be on break from school, and maybe it's the same way here as it is in the United States, at the end of the year, you have the end of year testing to see what you have learned, what you have retained over the year. What we need to understand as Christians, what we need to understand as those who are studying or concerned about spiritual matters, the true end of life test, it, it doesn't come on paper and pencil. It is life. The test set before you and for me today is what are we doing with what God has given us in this life? Here's where we have to begin. The psalmist would say in Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments and praise it. A good understanding. The fear of the Lord what? is that beginning of wisdom, beginning of knowledge, and that we have to have that proper understanding. Understanding comes through experience. Understanding comes from time. Understanding comes from help and encouragement and strength by those who have gone through and experienced what we are facing. Proverbs 1, 7, what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and they despise instruction. This word instruct would carry the ideal of correction. How about it, young person? How do you receive correction? 
See, that's, that's really a gift from God is correct for those who love us enough to say, hey, you need to make a change here. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the thing of the holy is understanding. Again, understanding, looking at what we are doing with what God has given us. I want to look at a number of individuals from the Bible. And especially these individuals in their early years as young people, what they did with what God had given them. Because we want to, number one, we'll first look at Joseph. And what we want to know of Joseph is that Joseph remained faithful to God without becoming bitter. I, I don't know if I could have filled that role as Joseph did. You remember early in his life he had the dream and he told his parents, he told his brothers and and they became upset with Joseph, even the parents. And so when these other things began to happen, and it's amazing when you read of Joseph's life, when the brothers turned against him, when he was sold into slavery, when he was placed into prison, all these things took place. Have you ever noticed how many times the Bible says, and the Lord was with him? That kind of amazes me. Wait a minute, the Lord's with, my brothers just, they wanted to murder me, and then they sold me into slavery. And, and, and then with Potiphar and his wife, and then in prison, and the Lord is with him. In Genesis 39, verse 7, you remember as Joseph is now in Egypt. And, and don't lose sight of the big picture. Why is Joseph in Egypt? Well, it's not just because his brethren sold him. God. God, and Joseph is going to tell us that later on if we don't realize it as we study that. Well, wow. God wants God to be known in Egypt. And he's going to do it through this young man, Joseph. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused. He said, Unto his master's wife, behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house. He hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but there, but thee, because thou art his wife. How can I do this great wickedness and what? Sin against God. Joseph, wait a minute. Your brothers, they hated you so much. They wanted to murder you. But rather than murder you, they just sold you into slavery. That which they thought very likely, did they not? That it would be at best a slow death in, in servitude as a, as a slave. Joseph, you're, you're not at home. No one here knows you. Joseph, your parents are not here. Joseph, your brothers are not here to report back and home. Why would you not take advantage of this lady? How can I do this thing? Uh, against my master, yes, but against God. And sin against God. What a great question. I think David answered the question, didn't he? He said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. Well, God, ever sin I commit is against you. Ever sin. In Genesis 15, in verse 19, you see, Joseph did not just become bitter. I, again, I don't know if that would have been me. In Egypt, I tell you what, I, I may serve, but I'm not going to like it. I may serve, but I'm not going to put my best foot forward. I may serve, but I may not do the best that I can. Isn't it interesting that he looked at Potiphar? who now owned him and said, I'll not do this against this man. That would be the man whom you think you would strike out against. But not Joseph. Not in his life. At the end of the book of Genesis, their father has died. They're taking the body back. They're, now they're coming back to Egypt, the brothers and Joseph. Joseph has, of course, made himself known. They're all, all in Egypt now. And they say, now's the time. 
Now's the time that Joseph is going to get back at us. Joseph said, as recorded in Genesis 50, verse 19, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Where would our hearts, where would our minds, where would our attitudes have been to such who have treated me so wrongfully? But he says, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is today to save much people alive. You see, Joseph looked beyond what was right here. Joseph looked beyond and through the physical, mental, emotional actions of his brethren and of all others. And he kept his eyes on God. What a great lesson for each of us. Whatever this life may bring. And others may look and say, well, they are not treating you fairly. Where are our eyes? Are our eyes going to be on other men? Or our eyes going to be on God? Why? It's not always just what you do. But what you think. How many times do we need to remember that in our lives? It's not just what we manifest, physically do. I tell you what. If I ever get a chance, I'm going to take it. No. No, we don't, we don't see that in Joseph's life. He reminded himself that he's a servant of God. Rather than less us, young and old alike, young people, now's the time to learn this lesson. Because the older we get, guess what? As each year goes by, there's going to be someone else that's going to take advantage of you who's going to misuse you or abuse you because they may have the power or they may have the opportunity. We cannot do that. I remember an older brother in Christ years ago, would, would write, he'd call me Timmy. He said, Timmy, no one else may do what's right, but you and I have to. Really, that's, that's exactly right. That's our responsibility. Why? Because I'm a follower of Christ. And therefore, I follow Christ and not what the world would do. When we think of these things, let's ask this question. We, we looked at the idea that, that Solomon had written that the beginning of knowledge what. Is that understanding, that acceptance of correction, of instruction? Young people especially, listen to me. Let me ask the question. Let's get our hearts right. Let's get our minds right. Not just the, the verbal exp uh, expression or response, not just a physical response, but where's our hearts and our minds when our parents are correcting us? Is that that we will receive it or that we despise it. I, th I think that's what God is asking us, isn't he? Uh, and of course, God knows our response. God knows our hearts. Well, what does that imply then? We can make a difference. We, we can decide that in my heart, in my mind, in my soul, I will well receive that correction and appreciate it. Why? Because I know their hearts and desire are that which is best for me. Let's look at another. Look at a man by the name of David. You say, well, Brother Hayes, now, I understand, and let's, let's not lose sight of this. Where did Joseph end up in life? He's sold, he's hated, he's despised, he's abused, he's missing. They lied about him. I think I remember God allowed him to be ruler in Egypt. Second only to the greatest. 
God used him. Let's see about David. David performed the duties that were set before him. Yeah, yes, he's king. He's... No, 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 no. Let's, let's not remember. David was not always king. David, David was not always at the top of the mountain. 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was the youngest. And the three elders followed Saul. And now, I don't want you to cry and feel sorry for me, but I'm the youngest of three. I know how it is to be. No, I'm just joking about it. I, I am the youngest. My wife says that's because I'm spoiled. That's, 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 that shows because she's the eldest in her family. So we have that little strife. But anyway, the Bible, for some reason, tells us David was the youngest. I think God wants us to know that. And, and, you know, sometimes as young as you are picked on, sometimes we bring it on ourselves. I'm not saying that about David. But anyway, the day, and David was young as three elders followed Saul. What does that mean? They're, they're going to war. They're in the army. They're in the military. David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. Have you ever been kind of pushed to the side because of your age? You're the youngest, so... What, the older get to do things. But guess what? The older, they're, they're going to battle. The older are going to war with King Saul. David, let me tell you what you get to do. Go home and take care of the sheep. I, I don't know how great an honor that was. Maybe especially in the eyes of this young man. Wait a minute, where are they going? They're going to follow Saul. You, they're going to be with the king. Where are you going? You get back out in the field with the sheep. Take care of the sheep. See, see what are we talking about? David performed the duties set before him. Because I think we're going to realize that tending sheep is going to prepare David for something that God has in mind for him later on. Now, remember, we're looking, at, if memory serves correctly, there in 1 Samuel 17. I think 1 Samuel 16 is where Samuel is going to anoint David. So he's already been anointed, knowing what's coming, but guess what we need you to do now, David? I, I don't need you to stand beside Saul. I don't need you to be with your brothers on the uh, front line. I need you to take care of sheep. Young people do sometimes we feel like we're not being used to the fullest and maybe we're being asked to tend sheep when we'd like to be on the forefront. Where's our hearts? Where's our attitude? Where's our mind at those times? Jesse said unto David his son, Take now thy bread, if of this parched corn, ten loaves, run to the camp thy to thy brethren, carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how they, thy brethren, fare, take their place. David, I need you to be an errand boy. I, I need you here. Here, no, you, you take care of the sheep, then you come home. Why? Because we have provisions for your brothers who are important in, in their battle. And, and I need you to take this, and then I need you to come back home and tell me how they're doing. How would you feel, young person? This is not what I want to do. We hear none of that from David. I think to Brother Bland's point, very likely what, what Jesse heard was, yes, sir. As David took the things prepared and as he did his duty. 1 Samuel 17, 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the bear and out of the paw of the lion, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. Even finally, David, David went, didn't he? Isn't it amazing? His brother said, hey, brother, good to see you. Hey, I really appreciate you bringing up the good. No, that was not it. The reception was not that grand. Because even as David came into the camp, What's going on? There is the divide between the camp of Israel and the camp of the Philistines. And each day, 
this giant, Goliath, was coming out. And, and he was rebuking Israel. He was rebuking God. Challenging Israel. Challenging God. And Israel was, honestly, they were cowering in their trenches. They were not answering the challenge. David's looking around like a young man would, and he's saying, well, where's the line of soldiers to prepare to assault Goliath? No one's going. Well, what, what will be done if you battle this man, you defeat him? All the great things. David is asking a legitimate question, but why is no one doing this? Oh, I see the older brother. Oh, I know. What were those few sheep that you're supposed to tend? Oh, I know what you're doing. You're just coming to see the battle. David, what's he saying? Go home. You're not wanted here. David, you know, Saul brings in here, take the armor. No, I, I've not earned it. It seemingly is too large for me. And he said, I've not done battle. He said, but what did he do? He Look at the simple weapons that he used. It's not a sword. It's not a spear. It's not a shield. Five little stones. You know, weapons that a shepherd boy would use. And I know David's not a little bitty boy at this time. But still, he used the implements that God provided and what God intended. And why? Because as he said, God has placed you in my hand, Goliath, today. The battle belongs to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Look at David's attitude. It's not, look what I'm going to do, but rather look what God is going to do. And God is going to defeat Goliath. He said, through the hand of God, through the power of God, I defeated the lion, I defeated the bear. God did that. What a beautiful attitude presented by this servant of God. David, even knowing he was going to be king, he performed the duty set before him. Young, person, young people, I don't know what God has in mind for you as you grow older. But I know what you can be as a young man. Now is the time to prepare yourself to be an elder in the Lord's church. Because you can so foolishly live and foolishly act that you make it impossible years later for you to serve as an elder. Now's the time to make up that mind. Young lady, I was at Freed Hardeman University or college at that time years ago. We were in Greek class. Brother William Woodson was teaching. There was a young lady seated in front of me. There were probably 30 preacher students in there, all men and one lady. And she was in class the, the same year with me, and I asked her later on, I said, Evelyn, what are, you, what are you doing in the preacher's training class? She said, because I plan on marrying a preacher, <laughs> and I plan on being able to help him. I hope she wouldn't mind me saying it. Well, well, let me just say, she married a preacher, and they've been doing some wonderful works around the world. Start now, young person. Don't wait until the brethren are looking around. Well, who, who, who can we get to be an elder? You live a life so they know who's prepared. Because I don't live in Singapore, but I know the need of elders around the world. I know we have that need in America, and you have the need here. You have need for leaders. Young ladies, same thing. You can either help him to be an elder or you can hinder him from being an elder. What are you going to do with the duty set before you? Now, tend the sheep. David, in tending the sheep, prepared him to face Goliath. David, in tending the sheep, prepared him to be king over Israel. David, in tending the sheep, Prepared him to serve God faithfully. What are, what are we going to do? How about this 
man by the name of Daniel. What do we want to know about Daniel? Daniel is going to reject the lead of man's word over God's word. Daniel 1, verse 11, Then Daniel said to Melzar, whom the prince of the units had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat, water to drink. Why, you go back, I believe, about verse 8, and it's going to say Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel is a very likely a teenager when he's taken captive. Daniel very likely is a teenager, if I'm reading what I'm reading correctly, and, and very likely made a eunuch. Very, here's what I know for sure. Daniel is living in a foreign country under a foreign government. And I see an attitude when, when Daniel, when there is a vision given and Daniel says, Oh, king, this, this is for those who hate you. Later, 70 years later, under another rule, under another nation, under another king, Daniel, are you alive? Did the God whom you serve save you? O king, live forever. Do you notice the attitude? I know Daniel's 80 or 90 years old when that statement. But look, that's his heart. That's his attitude throughout his life. Serving these men. You see, Daniel, they, they said, Daniel, here's what you need to eat. Here's what you need to drink. Here's the life you need to live. Daniel said, no. No, the life I need to live is the one presented by God. That's why Daniel starts by saying, or God starts that book by st telling us that Daniel purposed in his heart to serve God. Young person, do not wait till later. Do not wait until you're in that foreign country. Do not wait until you're serving under that foreign government. To now say, you know what, now's a good time to purpose in my heart. It's too late. If Daniel had waited until they were taken captive, it would have been too late. But Daniel made up his mind early in life. What? I'm going to serve God. Then when the friends come and say, let's go break the, the stepping stones. When the friends come, what? I think I remember a writer saying, don't follow a multitude to do evil. And I'm not throwing Brother Burroughs <laughs> under the bus, but I'll, I'll just point back to his point. Why? Because we've all been there. It may not be stepping stones, and you, you fill in the blank in your life. Now's when we have to decide as a young person because you're so blessed to have this opportunity. You do realize the majority of the world, the majority of the young people, will not be in gatherings such as this. The majority of the young people will not be reared in homes who have Christian mothers and fathers who love you so much. That they love you so much, they not only want to live here with you in a long life, they want to live with you in heaven forever. Make up your minds now. Reject the lead of the world. And follow the lead of God's word. In Daniel 2, 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of God. See what your attitude can do, young person. Daniel said, You just you let me follow my God. What's that going to do? It's going to change the world. You say, I can't change the world. You can, ch can you change yourselves? Yes. Then you can influence someone else. And they can influence someone else. And they can influence someone else. I think I remember the gospel beginning in Jerusalem in one city with 12 men. I'm not really good in math, but I can count more than 12 in this room. So what does that tell me? We can do what God would have us to do, young and old alike. One other point on this before I leave it, young people. 
when we think about uh, why? Because God does still say, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? This is right. Now, I'll just go ahead and, and preface this next statement with this one. I, I'll, I'll just make everyone mad with, in my next statement. Young and old alike. Listen to me. Parents do not know everything. You, you need to realize that. We, we as parents, we know it. We, we know we don't know everything. But you as young people, you need to understand it. What? What does that mean? We make mistakes. Now, we as parents, we need to stand up and say, hey, I made a mistake. I was wrong. But from here forward, we're going to do what's right. As young people, as children of these parents, you need to say, I love you. I forgive you. Let's go to heaven together. Parents do not know everything. That's number one. Young people, I'm going to make you mad with this statement, but it's the truth. But they know more than you. <laughs> Why? They've been there, done that. They have the T-shirts. You say, I don't like that. I can't help it. That's just fact of life. That's the reason why God put them in charge. And when you become parents, you'll be the ones in charge. Because you know, the parent knows, you put your hand on that hot stove, it will burn you. Why? Because they've been burned. They don't want to see you suffer. So say, no, 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 bring your hand back. And I know that's oversimplification of life, but isn't that really the fact of it? Reject the lead of man's word. Follow God's word. Let's look at another one. Hebrew youth. We've mentioned their names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those that were taken captive with Daniel. See, Daniel was not by himself. There were many others who were taken, but yet we are given these four. Why? Because of their great and godly lives, because of their great and godly example. What did these young men do? They refused to serve other gods. Not going to do it. Oh, King, one of the greatest statements in the Bible. When you hear the music, what, are, what were they to do? Bow down before the God. Bow down before my God. You, you mean to tell me as well as I've treated you, you're not going to serve my God? I thought we were friends. I thought you remembered I'm king. See, he was, he was their friend until they said, no, we're, we're not going to serve your God. I tell you what, I'll put you in the fiery furnace. Oh, King, we are not careful. Well, what would we say? In America, we'd say it like this. We are not going to mince words. We want it to be clearly. My daddy would say it like this. We need to speak like men. What does that mean? Very clearly. Let there be no misunderstanding, King. We are not going to bow before your God. You can make all the threats. You can do whatever. You can write the laws. We are not going to, what? There's one God and we're going to serve him. Isn't that what they say? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer. The, they're not saying, well, we're going to maybe kind of act like we're going to serve your God. Just in a side note, I would suggest you think about when, when we talk about that, that mark of the beast on the forehead or in the hand. To me, the, the way I take that, you know, if it's on your forehead, and I always ask the students, I say, well, uh, you know, the, the mark of the Lord, I don't see a mark on any one of your forehead. Did you all not obey the gospel? Well, see, it's not a literal thing. It's figurative. And so when you think of that, what? You think of a mark on the forehead, pretty much everyone sees your forehead, don't they? But you meet them, it's there. And so if there's a mark there, what? you should see it. What's that? You're either obviously going to be worshiping and serving God, or obviously you're going to be worshiping and serving Satan. Well, what's this thing about the mark in the hand? You know what? Uh, I, I could I could maybe take something from my pocket. And, and you know what? You don't know what I have in my pocket or in my hand. You, you don't know what's there. So unless I show you, you don't know. 
But if I want to kind of hide it and just kind of, hey, you know what? What about now? What's in my hand? What does that mean? Well, see, some people want to kind of hide and serve Satan. Brethren, we cannot hide and serve God. It's to be known by our lives. Young people refuse to serve false gods. I'll take your life. I, I, I realized this a few years ago. When the world threatens and Satan threatens to take our life, he can't have my life. Why? Because I gave my life to God a long time ago. You want my life? You're going to have to go see God about that. Because he owns it. He has it. He owns it. And God says, I think Brother Bland pointed this out in one of the lessons the other day. God says he cannot, Satan cannot snatch us out of the hands of God. Give your life to God, young person. Serve God. I'll take your life. So what? I go to my reward? How bad's that? At worst, I'm in paradise. That's, pr that's pretty good. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, oh, oh, king, we will not serve that God. We'll not worship the golden image. Daniel 3, 29. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, he said, let me tell you what, what had the uh, king's mind changed? You bow down before my God. He, he, he finally said, you know what? My God is nothing. The one true living God, he is everything. Never let us forget that, young people. Let's go to the New Testament. We're going to look at three points with Timothy. Brother Burroughs touched on some of these. And think about, we, we talked about we, all the different ones. We talked about Joseph, we talked about David, we talked about Daniel. How did they fare? I think each one were rulers by the power of God, by his might. How about this young man, Timothy? We, we read of him early. Let's notice three things. Number one, Timothy listened to godly influence at home. Brother Burroughs pointed that out. 2 Timothy 1, 5, Paul says, When I call to remember the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which was first, what? In thy mother, Eunice, and in thy grandmother, Lois, which I pray in thee also. What? That, that faith. I, I was blessed, so blessed. And I, I, I know that the older I get. Because so many of you and so many, most of the world did not grow up in the home in which I was afforded the opportunity. Why? Because my father was a Christian. My mother was a Christian. And not by name only. In, in my early years, my father served as a deacon. My mother taught Bible classes. In, in my later years, my father served almost until his death uh, as an elder in the Lord's church. My mother continued to teach Bible classes. I had grandmother and grandparent who were godly men and women. My grandfather, I told some of the students this, my grandfather on my daddy's side, before he, or as he entered the third grade, he had to drop out of school because he had to go to work in the coal mines. When he and my grandmother married, he could neither read nor write. When I discovered America, when I was born, my grandfather could read very well and write wonderfully. You know why? Because my grandmother was a Christian. And she taught him how to read and write by reading the King James Version of the Bible and studying it. You want to see what being in a Christian home would do for you? See, my grandmother's father, he grew up in a denomination and later in life, he wanted to be a preacher. He was about to go to a seminary for a denomination. And one Sunday, he, they asked him to speak. So my papa, my great-granddaddy, stood up in that congregation of people and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's right. Not a denomination doctor. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. They said, 
Gaddis, you, you can't preach that here. Why? That's Camelite doctrine, what they called it in America, to, to kick against the church. He said, I don't know what you're talking about, Camelite. He said, I, where did you get that? I read it in the Bible. You cannot preach that here. I thank God so often for my great granddaddy's faith because he said, if I cannot preach it here, I'll find a church where I can. There's where he found the Lord's church. And because of that, he taught his daughter, who taught her husband, who taught their son, my father, who taught me. Oh, for the faith. You say, well, I'm not married. I, I, I'm not looking to be married now. You know, that happens, kind of sneaks up on us sometimes. You're not looking in there, and they say, you know, you're married. Next thing you know, you have children. What do you want to do? You want to be a Christian spouse, husband, and or wife. You want to be a Christian parent. Why? If, if, brethren, I would suggest this. It's either out of ignorance or arrogance if we say we love our children and we fail to teach them the gospel. Because to love my child, the greatest thing I want for my child, the greatest thing I want for my spouse is for us to be in heaven. If they ever, if they ever live in a nice house or have a nice car or have a nice, it matters not. They must be obedient unto God. That's what Timothy learned at home. Let's make our homes. I may not be able to change what's being taught in my neighbor's home. But I can make a difference what's taught in my home. And we're going to follow God. The beginning of Timothy's spiritual education began at home. Let's make sure that's taking place in our home as well. With Timothy, his influence, the godly influence, was not just only what he received at home, but he learned from the godly influence outside of home. How do I know that? Because I read the writings of a man by the name Paul. Paul have any influence over Timothy, over this young man? See, there's, there's a young man who's been trained. He's been taught the scriptures from a youth. So when he goes out on his own, now he's still looking those who teach the scriptures. Fortunately, God, through God's providence, I would suggest, they were brought together. And Paul is able to strengthen this young man. 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul says unto him. And now understand, I, I truly believe that 1 and 2 Timothy are written from a perspective of a young man who's a member of the Lord's church, who's a Christian, but who, who is disheartened. I, I don't know what has happened, but something has happened, and he's become discouraged. And Paul's writing to him. He can't be with him at that time. But he says, let me write to my young brother and encourage him, strengthen Build that fire back up into him again. And that's why in 2 Timothy 2, 2, Paul says, And the things what? which thou hast heard of me. Timothy, you know what I teach. You know the gospel. Remember it. The things I heard of me among many witnesses. What? Timothy, you're, don't just leave it in your heart and in your mind. You commit to faithful men who are able to teach others also. Young person, you have a responsibility. I firmly believe this statement I'm going to make is true. If you're old enough to be a child of God, you're old enough to serve God, to do what God's commanded, to, to go about and teach others. If you're not old enough to do that, you're not old enough to be a child of God. A child of God is a child of God. Now, I understand you, as a young person, you cannot serve as an elder right now. I understand that. But as a child of God, there are things we are, have great responsibility, obligations, and privileges to do. <laughs> Was Peter just writing to the older? When he said, be ready to give that answer, the reason of the hope? Or was he writing to all who have obeyed the gospel, who have that reason of hope? Do you know why you obey? Do you know what you've done? Can you tell others? Yes. See, Timothy learned for God to influence. Let's notice one more. 
He listened to the godly influence at home. He learned from the godly influence outside the home. He leaned upon the godly influence from the heavenly home. There's where it has to be. It has to begin there and end there. That place called heaven. To the text Brother Burroughs quoted earlier, 2 Timothy 3, 14, beginning, but continue thou. See, it's not enough just to begin the walk. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Knowing what? Knowing of whom thou hast learned. Do you know Timothy? More importantly, do you know God? The, thing, the one from whom we learn to say, that from a child thou has known the holy scriptures. God bless the women who teach our babies and our little children in our Bible classes. May God bless each of you for doing that. Why? Because you're building a foundation upon which can be built the greatest life ever. What? The life of a Christian. Paul said of the Holy Scriptures, they're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. If Timothy failed to live righteously, faithfully, It does not matter how faithful those were in the home in which he was reared if, if Timothy rejected it. Or if he received it then and then when he turned away from it later, when he moved out of home, when he, as we would say, got on his own. If Timothy failed to live faithfully, Timothy failed. If he failed to accept and remember what mom and dad had taught and what others, had, good and godly men and women taught. Brethren, if we fail to do it ourselves, young people, we fail. Do not fail this test. Do not fail this life that is set before us. Because Why? Because God is training us through his word, through parents, through beloved older and brothers, sister, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's so many in our lives. But the question is, as we began our study today in Matthew 25, with those who were given certain talents, certain opportunities, abilities, Let's end it with this. What are you doing with what God is giving you? Thank you very much for this opportunity.